this week on Dig Me Out. With your hosts, Jason Zia and Tim Minichi. Jay, we're back again with another episode thanks to our Dig Me Out Union on Patreon. You can help us make the next episode happen by joining us at dmounion.com or digmeoutunion.com. And Jay, speaking of the union, yeah, it's a poll result. A poll. It's the poll from February of uh, the 2022. I can't believe we've made it this far. 2022 doesn't seem possible. How are we not living on the moon right now? Doesn't I don't understand. You're saying you're amazed that we haven't um, created a colony off planet. Yes. <laughs> How is it? I mean, come on. You ex- as a child, you expected by now to be. You understand that in the 1960s, when the when the Apollo program was happening, they had Mars and Moon and Mars settlement plans, and then they just gave it up. Are you? We aware went to the we went to the moon with basically the equivalent of like a Texas Instrument calculator compared to what we have today. Are you aware that um, Neanderthal and Homo sapiens coexisted on Earth for ten thousand years? You say coexisted like they were friends, but I don't think they were friends. There was a lot of rock throwing going on. There was. What's your point is what I'm saying. I just want to get to the moon. I'm saying like we started to go to space. How long ago? 60 years ago? Yeah. (laughs) Come on. I only got so much time here is what I'm saying. Let's go. And they were on Earth for 10,000 and accomplished basically nothing. Right. (laughs) Well, they were lazy. This is true. They were lazy and stupid, but they they didn't understand the tenets of capitalism or fire or fire. All right. We're way off track here. Or how to make a wheel. Uh, Speaking of all of this, (laughs) we have a poll and that poll is brought to us by our patrons voting on it. And the people at digmeoutpodcast.com who suggested these records. Some of those are the same. Because our patrons also like to suggest records, but some of them are not. Let's go through them, shall we? Richard Waterman suggested the Swinger soundtrack. Eric Peterson suggested Welcome the Infant Freebase by Soundtrack of Our Lives. Willie Dillon suggested Generation Six Pack by Pure. Kyle Bittner suggested Modern Life is Rubbish by Blur. Darren Lehman suggested the self-titled album by the Screamin' Cheetah Wheelies. Atta suggested On by Echo Belly. Adam Green suggested Teenager of the Year by Frank Black. Robert Cam suggested Perpetual Motion Machine by 13 Engines. And Patrick suggested Reality of My Surroundings by Fishbone. And this was for a period of time a close poll. But alas, Fishbone, 13 Engines, Frank Black, Echo Belly, The Screaming Cre- Cheetah Willies, Screaming Cheetah Wheelies, The Soundtrack of Our Lives, and The Swinger Soundtrack all fall behind, uh, and Blur, all fell behind Pure's Generation 6 back. The closest to that was Echo Belly and Blur. They both came up with 14% of the vote, but Pure with 28% of the vote One this poll and it even i want to point out that kyle bittner suggested blur's modern life is rubbish but then went against his own suggestion and voted for 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 pure uh i can understand he may have suggested pure in the past this was the third time that it had been suggested same album or different albums same album by three different people Wow. They really yeah. wanted us to like, they're going to be so disappointed when we review that. No, I'm just not going to give that away. Uh, had you heard of the band pure? No. I mean, it's, 
it looks very familiar, but I don't know right. if that's because I actually saw it or it's just it's so quintessential 90s. Right. In terms of the album cover and the name of the band and everything. I, I knew the band name, but I had not listened to them. So let's talk a little bit about who they were and, and what their deal was. So Pure was from Vancouver, British Columbia. Hmm. They were active between 1991 and 2000. Uh, the band was made up of a singer Jordy Birch, guitarist Todd Simcoe, bassist Dave Headley, and drummer Lee Grant. That was the original lineup. Grant, the drummer, was replaced by Jim Hobbs in 1996. And Mark Henning uh, was playing keyboards, but he left in 1994. So they put out their first album, Pure Finalia, in 1992. It was released on um, Reprise Records. It was preceded by a, a, an EP called Greed. And then this is where things get a little murky because it's the 90s. They originally released Generation Six Pack with the number six on Reprise Record in 1994. They then re-released it in 1996 on Mammoth Records in the United States with the six spelled out. Two different album covers as well, but the same songs. Gotcha. Then they put out, in between those, they put out the Extra Purestrial EP. There's, a little, there's some pure puns going on here. Yeah. Uh, that came out on Shag Records in 1995. And then their final album, Feverish, came out on Mammoth Records in 1998. Um, of all the members, the one that you might know of is um, Todd Simcoe. He played on Biff Naked's first album, and he is a producer and engineer now in Vancouver, and he's worked with a couple, you know, a variety of artists. Um, well, actually, he actually passed away in 2012, but he had worked with a number of artists, including like Marcy Playground and some other ones. Um, and the uh, they won some Juno Awards in Canada, which is the equivalent of like, you know, our, uh, I was going to say Golden Globes. It's not the Golden Globes. It's the, the Grammys. <laughs> Um, they won the most promising group of the year. That's such a positive <laughs> award. It's a little most promising backhanded, isn't it? It's like you haven't quite gotten there yet, but we see the potential. <laughs> you were really excited about the band when we heard heard the uh heard about you and saw your album cover. We know you've got it. You just haven't gotten it yet. We but we believe in you. There should be a follow-up award like most successfully achieved their talent and skill level. Right. <laughs> Something along those lines. Uh, we, so we got comments over on Patreon from folks. They were all over the place. People did, uh, you know, uh, talk about all the other bands you know but they did talk about pure to for somewhat uh david gorgos did not um he went with the swinger soundtrack uh you know we did like a whole swingers episode i guess we didn't cover that soundtrack specifically but it was there was quite a bit on that one i'm surprised yeah. that came up again people apparently wanted to hear more swing music and us talk about it that's all right um John Pennycock said, I love Frank Black's first two albums, voting for Teenager of the Year. Sorry, that didn't win. Uh, Scott Witt went with The Screaming Cheetah Wheelies. Joe Royland went with Fishbone. Jeremy Amend. Blur. Mike Bankhead. Uh, he went with Frank Black. Tara McCook says Screaming Cheetah Wheelies. Badim Tavor. Badim Tavor, sorry. Echo Belly. Um... And then uh, that's where I think where Keith Badge went as well. Darren Lehman, Screaming Cheetah Willies. Who voted for Pure? Oh, Kyle Bittner. I'm going against my own album, Blur, and I'm voting with I'm voting for Pure. Not Blur, Pure. Whitney Beeler went with Pure. Okay, Jeremy Amend. He switched his vote to Pure. 
Or he had voted for something else. Mm. Mm. Sean Brown said Pure would make a great episode, as would Echo Belly and Blur. Have to go with Fishbone. Should have gone with your first instinct, Sean. Gavin so, said, a solid list. I'm taking Echo Belly. Mm, we're not. Uh, Whitney Buehler, I'm going with Pure. Kyle Bittner followed it up. I'm very happy that Pure won, even though my blur lost. That's a very that's a very courteous uh, uh, consideration there from uh, from Kyle. Even though he lost, he was happy. I, I wish we could all take that same attitude. So, Jay? Yeah? Let's talk about this record. Let's Tell me it. one thing you liked about Generation 6 Pack by Pure. Well, not only does the album cover take you back to the 90s and the name, but immediately as this record starts, um, I was I was teleported back in time. Uh, it is just so 90s from the guitar fuzz to the very um, almost slackery kind of vocal style. And it's kind of like this laid back, a bit spoken you know it's melodic you know delivers melody but there's definitely an attitude and sort of a i don't give a shit at it you know aspect to it that permeates the record uh you know it's big and fuzzy it's loud and and quiet you know dynamic wise it follows kind of the nirvana slash weezer formula in that way with you know songs that are at least a handful of songs that are in that mid tempo, you know, slow, slowish, quiet verse with big exploding fuzzy um choruses. So, you know, it it's a it's familiar in a way, you know, when you listen to it, it sounds vaguely like a lot of other bands, but not exactly, you know, like anyone in particular. Uh so it's definitely um a, a a uh, bit of nostalgia i think even if you haven't heard the band you still like can't help but think about a lot of uh, bands of that era and, and that this time period of you know 93 94 uh i think one of the standout things that was interesting was just the use of slide on the record was a bit different uh there's some riffs here that that incorporate it pretty well there's some solos uh it's kind of a nice little element that i think just provide some variety and makes it makes them sound distinct and just a little bit different But overall, you know, it's it's big guitars uh, and melodies, and for the most part, pop songwriting. You know, some of these songs are they're all coming in around three four minutes. They're song verse or verse chorus verse chorus songs, uh, soft loud. You know, nothing groundbreaking here, but competent, pretty well crafted. You know, produced pretty well, uh, but very much of the of the time um, in my. Uh, from my perspective so what did you uh what'd you think of it well i was thinking back to our last review of death ray and how much we enjoyed the really tight yeah songwriting the very dry production and this is like almost the polar opposite of that in a lot of ways yeah as these big fuzzed out bombastic occasionally like loose kind of feel to it that works just as well at being on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, I really dug hearing that big fuzzy guitar that, you know, they bust out on 
Like Anna is a good example of the loud, quiet thing that happened in the 90s. And there's songs that play with that big fuzzy sound. Um, I think it's track six. Lemonade, which kind of gets yeah. into a little bit more like kind of druggy kind of sound. It's more like chill. But it it also has some big, almost like shoegazy kind of wall of noise things happening. Yeah. Um, that I really dug the relaxed aspect of the vocal and the slackerish kind of I know I know that's a kind of a cliche uh for the nineties, but it's it's not an an attack vocal. It's not it's not on top of everything. Yeah. It's on the back of the beat and it's it's well put together in terms of with that big fuzz, you could lose the vocal real easily. And I think his voice cuts through enough. Yeah. So that you always get the hook and you always get the the vocal part. And it's pretty, uh, you know, with bands like this, we've done bands like this that have had big fuzzy sounds and, and the music dominates. But I felt like I was constantly remembering as I was going through it, like the hooks here and there of the mm-hmm. vocals. Like Anna is a speed freak. Like that just like stuck in my head and other little things here and there that made me appreciate like you know this is a band that had a little bit of like um uh discography behind them you know they already had one record but they had a couple eps a bunch of singles like they weren't this was this is a little bit more um i think on the surface you might go it's just kind of like a, a grungy distorted fuzzy record but i feel like these songs are a little better constructed and and the melodies and are a little smarter than maybe they would come across to the average listener because i think a lot of people might throw this on just go it just sounds like 90s grunge like mm, actually there's a little bit there's there's some poppy elements that are really sort of slyly stuck in to some of these songs that i don't think that would be caught on a casual listen yeah there's definitely some earworms in here that they've they've stumbled on and um there's there's a there's a level of craft too in in terms of how the songs are put together and the um, you know they know how to play with the dynamics and <clears throat> use that to great effect they don't know how to get they know how to put together guitar tones and you know create a big sound you know which is a big part of this record right when they launch into those big fuzzy guitars and they lay into the cymbals and you know, that's uh, one of the main reasons why you're listening to it is for those dynamics. Uh, they can they can also get in some places that are, you know, pushing it a bit. Like a song like Monster to me could be a almost like an early hum song. You know, it's got that same interesting quiet part that's not, you know, typical just strumming. There's some um, cool tones there. And then they launch into these, you know, epic drum fills and guitar riffs that have little harmonic bits mixed in and you know get you to a place that is similar to hum i mean they don't have the progressive chops that hum has Mm -hmm. but it's in the ballpark in terms of you know the just the uh, epicness of it There's some experiments here and there, um, you know, to kind of show some range. There's there's bits and parts that, you know, like 
Primoana is a good example of the vocal gets in that back territory where they take you know the slacker sound to to the to the limit. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, there's there's some tunes in here if you're a fan of Weezer. Presidents United States was another band that came to mind. Mm. Um, that kind of uh, raw, um, kind of bit punky take on pop music, you know, or pop rock. You know, they definitely are, I think, you know, in that direction and distinguishing, I think, what you're saying about um, they're not just a fuzzy alternative, you know, punky band. There's definitely some songwriting and melody going on here that distinguishes them. I, I want to follow up. The slide guitar stuff is really cool. Yeah. Uh, on nobody knows I'm new wave denial. Those are interesting uses of slide that I would not have expected. Well, you don't think of slide being used with like a, a really fuzzy guitar sound. Yeah. So the fact that they incorporated that was really interesting and not super obvious either. Yeah. Like I think most people probably wouldn't even realize it, but being guitar nerds, I can tell that's what, what they're using, but it's not like, hit you over the head like oh the guy's playing slug guitar right yeah it's not showy in like a yeah or, or even way. O- overly bluesy it's more uh you know alternative type or hard rock riffs just using a slide well the like denial that slide riff and that what's happening in that song like that could be a royal trucks riff yeah but you've got the fidelity there that's just up to notch um in terms of what didn't work there was some like messing around on this record that yep. I just it just like n- threw me for a loop yeah in some spots did you experience that too yeah um wagner show is like a weird circus music track i don't know yeah. what's going on there that should be a um, hidden track popsicle is like juvenile I, I, it's just kind of dumb um so yeah there are definitely some moments here that feel unnecessary um and then i, I think there's also like to me a song like denial is symbolic of it's just too simple like it's too predictable maybe not simple but predictable like when that song starts within 30 seconds or 20 seconds, like I, I pretty much know everything that's going to happen. Right. Like I know what the riff's going to be the rest of the song. I know what the vocal melody is going to, there's just nothing about it that really jumps out and, and, and is unexpected or clever. It's just a very, I want to say lazy, but just not a very inspiring song. And it's not alone. You know, there's some others that are strike me that way. They're just not super clever or hooky or anything. They're just kind of like bland. Yeah. Um, yeah. Denial's a really cool idea that should be two minutes, not 339. Yeah. You know, if you can't come up with another part to really push that song into something special then cut cut it in half cuz it's it goes on too long yeah. even though it's only not even 4 minutes but they just they don't have anywhere to go the same thing with uh the tip that's another song where i do like the sound of that song Just try and 
I love the shaker. It has this cool bluesy kind of Southern rock vibe, you know, but really heavy with this fuzzed out, like maxed fuzzed out. Like it's almost like blowing up the speaker sound. Mm -hmm. But again, after about 30, 40 seconds of that song, you're it, there's, it doesn't give you anything else. Like that's the song. It doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. I don't know what to do to get out of that riff. And it's just kind of like stuck in that groove. And it's a cool groove. It's just doesn't warrant even the two and a half or almost three minutes that it is because it's just one idea, you know? So this album could have used some dynamics that were more than just quiet loud. Yeah. I think that's what is missing here. Like they didn't fully explore in certain songs, what you could fully do with them. And they, that's where like the, more tossed off feel of the record becomes a little frustrating because it, it definitely feels loose and has a vibe of slacker niche, whatever slacker ish, whatever you want to, how you want to say that. But for the most part, especially in the beginning of the record, they're able to pull it off pretty well. And then there's just some stuff that I just wish there was like a little bit more thought put into the, track drugs guns and booze is a it, i think that's a good example of uh it's the melody is not as predictable it's a more sophisticated vocal melody yeah it's a more acoustic driven um that is a to me a good example of some left turns that they should take could have taken a couple more times mm -hmm. um that would have made the record i think a little more um interesting start to finish um what'd you think of that track it's kind of stuck right in the middle too i liked it and i like that it was like polar opposite of everything that the band was doing yeah it felt a little repetitive at times um but i i it wasn't enough to like make me want to dump the track i like that there was the organ stuff yeah, and I guess it was just like missing like one element for me on that track. I don't know what it was, but there was just like one thing more that I needed to, to push it into. Like, oh, this is a really good song. Like, it was very solid, but I just needed one more element to make a killer. Yep. So I'm with you. So. I mentioned that this was released twice. Um, once in Canada, and then it was re-released for the United States. 96, like, Anna was the single, and then The Hammock and Lemonade were the other singles. I don't know, like, Anna, I guess because it's, it's got the chorus and yep. it's kind of unusual. Like I could see that being like a minor hit, but neither the hammock or lemonade stand out to me as like amazing single material. They're good songs, but I just didn't, I just don't hear them as like radio songs. So I don't, I like, this is very much a, I'm not surprised it didn't sell, you know, half a million copies type of record. Lemon Lemonade was a song that I think had the most potential. And as a radio, like 94, like what's going to make it on American radio? Um, right. I also think it's a good example of uh, that song maybe needs a better vocal and just a bit more editing. You know, it needs to just be four minutes it needs to be trimmed up get to the hook faster um and i just think that chorus vocal just needs to get more it's just too droney you know and, and if it just was more dynamic or you know even if his voice broke up or there was a harmony in there or it needs something to make it yeah. go over the top so like the it feels like the sketch is there for you know a, a radio tune in '94, but just didn't quite execute. You know what bothered me about that vocal in terms of it 
I mean, the chorus is there, but they double track the vocal. Yeah. And it gives it this sort of like this wider sound. Yeah. And it actually needed a more direct vocal. Like if you had ta- not doubled it, yeah. maybe a harmony, but I think that that's what actually hurts it from being like more of a pop song. Yeah. Is, is, is you kind of flatten that vocal out so that it's not, a, it doesn't, it's not as impactful when it's doubled like that. Just a you know, straight what, double. The way he's saying too, he's not like, I think it calls for like a guttural, like, ah, oh, like a big go for it vocal. And right. he's like in this like, like tone. And then they just double that. And you just got like this droning double tracked vocal over these huge fuzzy guitars that just like you're saying it just doesn't cut through and get me that emotion right uh, that that you need to really pull you in and hook you on a on a big chorus to wash car sponge those There was a single version of it uh, uh, out there in the ether and they just didn't like come to it because when he's hitting the the lemonade and stuff like that, like there should be accents like slamming like to accent. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. that re- that required like a a pop producer, not a pop producer, but like a, a, a rock producer with pop credentials to mm-hmm. to f- to hammer out that song because it's there. But it almost sounds like the demo version of what would be a really good radio single. Yes, yes. Very, very demo-ish. Uh, we are available to uh, retroactively turn your hits, turn your misses into hits. <laughs> Shit, that, that's probably going to happen at some point. You know that, right? There's going to be some movement to like dig up and reproduce or re-record. I mean... Think about it. Nobody knows that song. So right, why right, not right. just take that song and re-record it, but do all the things that we're talking about? And you could probably come up with a nice little pop single that you could maybe get some traction with. I mean, I bet there's like a billion of those songs in the 90s that just like, you know, they got scooped up. They had a tiny budget to make a record and and re-record it. Sure, you're not going to make any money off of the, the the writing, but you get some, I don't know, mechanical royalties if you sell a record good luck uh let's get into it overall yeah. ratings on this record were the album better ep or decent single better ep for me uh i like what it is and uh <clears throat> the hammock lemonade drugs booze guns and booze nobody knows i'm new wave uh the end of the record is a bit of a slog for me monster mm-hmm. is a standout track like I said, I love the vibe of the tip. It's just not fully realized. So uh, I'm at an EP. Where are you at, Tim? I'm pretty much right there with you. I'm at an EP, basically the same songs. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff just just need a little bit of polish. And I, I don't want to lose like the what they're doing well. Yeah, yeah. But just pick certain songs to just slightly adjust or you know go in a little bit of different direction and when you say polish i mean i guess the other way i would think about that is just something remarkable right <laughs> like whatever that is like if it's a production if it's a part if it's a performance I, something like yeah. i don't want to lose the little, fuzz 
yeah i, I like the lose the personality and the personality but there's just missing something to put it over top and i think long stretches right. of this sound very average yep so that's two better eps for myself and Jay on Generation Six Pack by Pure, I'm sure this will make our Canadian contingent uh, question our our sanity because they were quite hyped for us to uh, check out this record. Uh, it's okay. We'll we'll get into some Our Lady Peace or something soon and really piss people <laughs> off. Uh. We do need to thank all of our contributors and all of our voters to this. Thanks to, uh, it was Kyle who was the one who, or no, sorry, Willen, Willie, sorry, Willie Dillon, who was the one who suggested it. Kyle, who abandoned his own pick to vote for this. So thank you, along with everyone else who uh, took part in this poll. And if you would like to vote in one of our polls, you just have to join us at Patreon, Dig Me Out Union, DMOUnion.com. That's where you go. And you get to vote in these polls for as little as two bucks a month. Also get free 80s episodes available only at Patreon every other month. Got one just dropped in uh, recently on uh, Dio. So digmeoutpodcast.com is where you go. You can find the Patreon links there. You can also go sign up for our box newsletter, which is delivered every week to your email. It's also free when you sign up for Patreon. and. Uh, you can deposit an idea for an album we should check out by going to our suggest an album page, drop it in there and it might show up in one of these polls down the road. And then last but not least, if you like what you heard, please leave us some positive feedback. We need that. We need that little adrenaline rush of people loving us. We're, we're humans. We crave it. We crave positive feedback. Yeah. You know, keep keep us going. Give us a little nudge. We don't want you to necessarily, you know. I mean, I've been thinking about crazy throwing, throwing it in. I need a little, yeah, a little little encouragement. Jay and I have done this for a long time. We're tired, barely slept. Our bones are weary. Our skin is frail. Our eyes are heavy. I think you're missing our hearing damage. Our ears. <laughs> What? Exactly. <laughs> uh, no, my hearing is fine because I just keep getting uh, better and better ear ear uh, phones and headphones and turning up louder and louder. So that's Actually, fine. We've, we've probably recovered a, a bit. I, I know that I, at least I haven't been to many live shows in the last 10 years sure. compared to the, the previous 10. So. Well, I am going to Iron, Iron Maiden in the fall, so I'm sure my hearing yeah. will be ruined. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, throw some throw some horns, bang some heads, and lose my hearing again, like an old man. Uh, well, that's it. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of Dig Me Out.